First, I want to say I am beyond honored and humbled to be here today to help spread the message about the importance of youth vaccination. It's important to have conversations with friends and family members, encouraging all communities to get vaccinated. No red lights or stop signs kept 18-year-old superstar Olivia Rodrigo from the White House briefing room delivering an important message to young Americans tonight, get vaccinated. And this comes as preventable deaths are surging among the unvaccinated, as some states are reporting a rise of children in the ICUs. Tonight, our conversation with an official in Tennessee who says she was fired when she tried to push for teens to get vaccinated. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. And tonight, we are getting a chilling look into the moments that the condo in Surfside came tumbling down. Dozens of 911 calls released this afternoon. They paint a sobering picture about the tragedy as it unfolded. And tonight, the deadly wildfire danger. New evacuations ordered more than five dozen fires burning up and down the West Coast tonight and in Alaska. A million acres destroyed. And yet we're still months away from the peak of wildfire season. Matt Gutman on the fire lines tonight. And Rob Marciano is tracking the conditions. Tonight, we are learning about a brazen international kidnapping plot here in New York. Iranian operatives under arrest and charged for allegedly targeting an American journalist. Federal prosecutors say the plan was to capture her, whisk her away on speedboats to Venezuela, and transfer her to Iran. We hear from her tonight. And our in-depth report tonight, one week after that stunning presidential assassination in Haiti, what comes next for the Caribbean country? And this is where the gun battle happened. You can see the massive bullet hole left in the wall here, and there are a lot of them on the building. Shattered glass and also spent shell casings. And look at what is left of this building, this burned out building. All right, all right, all right. But all right, indeed, he has come a long way since playing a Texas teenager in Days and Confused decades ago. But tonight, Hollywood superstar Matthew McConaughey is considering a run for a different job, governor of his Lone Star State. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with just heartbreaking new insight into the immediate aftermath of the Surfside condo collapse. Tonight, newly released 911 calls give us a sense of the fear in real time for residents who were inside, many of them trapped, pleading with 911 operators for help. 20 days later, this is what remains of the 12-story building after that catastrophic failure. The investigation into what went wrong so far has revealed problems with the pool deck and the underground parking garage dating back as early as 1996. At that point, the building had been up for just 15 years. 96 people are now confirmed to have died in the collapse, at least 11 still unaccounted for. And tonight, for the first time, we are hearing from some of those residents, the ones who woke up to a cascade of tumbling steel. Victor Kendo is in Surfside tonight with the heartbreaking cries for help to 911 dispatchers. For the first time tonight, we're hearing the anguish calls to 911 moments after the Surfside condo suddenly collapsed. Oh my God. Oh my God! Oh my God! It happened while most were sound asleep around 1.30 in the morning. I woke up because I was hearing some noise. I looked out outside and I saw the patio, patio area started sinking down. The building just went to the sinkhole. So there will be many, many people there. This woman panicked, apparently calling from the part of the Champlain Tower South, still standing. Virtual, virtual. Yes, I'm at Champlain Tower. Something's going on here. you got to get us out of here. Okay, you're in your apartment right now? Yes, but half the building's gone. Another woman on the line with 911 as she desperately tried to escape from the garage. We think the roof collapsed in the building. A bunch of us are in the garage, but we cannot get out. We're going back up the stairwell. The garage is inundated with water. We don't know where the water is coming from. One man leading his family to safety while telling the operator. There's people in the rubble yelling. Rescue workers searching the rubble for 14 days, desperately looking for survivors. This boy saved the night of the collapse. The search recently shifting to a recovery mission. Crews, local leaders, and the community pausing for this moment of silence. Now three weeks since the collapse, 96 victims have been found, the youngest, one-year-old Aishani Gia Patel, identified just yesterday. At least 11 people are still missing. Still those unaccounted for. Victor Kendo joins us now. Victor, there are new questions tonight about warning signs that may have been missed. What's the latest on that? 
Lindsay, we have obtained documents indicating that as far back as 1996, inspectors were calling for repairs to the garage and to the pool. Keep in mind, that's just 15 years after the building was constructed. And while those repairs were eventually made, some experts that we've spoken with say that is still pretty unusual and will certainly be part of the investigation moving forward. Lindsay? Victor Akendo, our thanks to you. COVID deaths continue to increase across the country. The difference this time around is that medical experts say the large majority of these deaths could have been prevented by vaccines. New ABC analysis shows how this growing crisis is being propelled by those who are unvaccinated. ABC's Whit Johnson has those details. Tonight, the highly contagious Delta variant taking hold across the country, now estimated to account for nearly 58% of all new COVID cases. At least 44 states and territories reporting a weekly increase. We can expect to see um, hospitalizations um, rise. Uh, we'll probably see deaths go up. Cases in New York City more than doubling in just one week, from 182 on July 6th to 429 on July 12th, fueled by the Delta variant. Los Angeles County seeing a 500% jump in COVID cases over the past month. Health officials saying all of those hospitalized are not fully vaccinated. The Delta variant is here in California. It's spreading and it's spreading past. And concern growing for kids who are not yet eligible for a vaccine. In Mississippi, health officials report seven children with COVID are being treated in ICUs, two of them on ventilators. These seem to be more uh, classic COVID symptoms, fever, cough, respiratory illness. And I suspect that's probably because this Delta variant is imparting a little more severe illness in the pediatric population. In West Dallas, police officer and father Arnolfo Pargas is on a ventilator fighting for his life. His wife says he was so focused on helping others get vaccinated, but he failed to do it himself. He was working the day we went. He was supposed to come with us. And he's like, no, you guys go ahead and go. I'll go later. And he said it too. I should have just went and got vaccinated. So many now in hospital rooms wishing that they had gotten that shot. Whit Johnson joins us now. Whit, there's some new data out about the impact of the vaccine campaign in New York City, which of course was the epicenter of the virus. What does the study show? Lindsay, experts at Yale University estimate that vaccines have likely prevented about 250,000 COVID cases in New York City and more than 8,000 deaths. The city also saying that more than 98% of those who were hospitalized or died from COVID this year were not fully vaccinated. Lindsay. With Johnson, our thanks to you. We are joined now by Dr. Michelle Fiscus, formerly the top vaccine official in the state of Tennessee. She says that she was fired from her role as the medical director of the Vaccine Preventable Diseases and Immunization Program at the Tennessee Department of Health after sharing a memo with medical providers outlining guidelines on whether older minors could be vaccinated without parental consent. Dr. Fiscus, we thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks so much for having me. So first, just quickly explain to our audience what was in that memo and the response that it generated from the state's political leaders. Thank you. Yes, so um, I had been uh, reached out to by several medical providers in the state that were providing COVID-19 vaccines. And this was just before the authorization of the Pfizer vaccine down to age 12. And they were asking, what do we do if a minor shows up to be vaccinated and they're not accompanied by a parent? Can we, can we vaccinate them or not? And uh, so I reached out to the general counsel at Tennessee Department of Health and asked them for language around Tennessee's mature minor doctrine, which is Tennessee Supreme Court um, case law that went into effect in 1987, 34 years ago, that states that children who are ages 14 and older, if deemed mature enough to make the decision by their medical provider, can elect to um, have medical treatment without the consent of their parent. Um, um, our Office of General Counsel sent me the, the language around that, told me that it was approved by uh, or blessed by the governor's office, told me it was posted to the internet, it was publicly available, and that I could share that information however I saw fit. So I put it into a memo to our COVID-19 vaccine providers in the state, some of whom uh, apparently had concerns about that and felt that the communication to these medical professionals was an attempt on my part to undermine parental authority for the control of their children um, in making medical decisions. Um, that progressed to 
them contacting state legislators who um, eventually called the Department of Health to a government ops uh, meeting on June the 16th, where um, some legislators went so far as to call for the dissolution of the State Department of Health, um, claiming that we were targeting children inappropriately um, when what I had done was share a 34-year-old Tennessee case law um, for the awareness of those providers so that they would understand where the rules were around vaccinating minors in the state of Tennessee. And you wrote in the Tennessean newspaper, I have been terminated for doing my job because some of our politicians have bought into the anti-vaccine misinformation campaign rather than taking the time to speak with the medical experts. And it is the people of Tennessee who will suffer the consequences of the actions of the very people they put into power. Your state currently only has 38 percent of its residents fully vaccinated. How much do you believe that politics and misinformation is hurting public health efforts to convince more people to get vaccinated there? I think it weighs heavily upon that. You know, we, we know, uh, especially as pediatricians who've worked in vaccine hesitancy for decades now, that you can move people to making the, the right choice for their health and, and their well-being um, if you make a strong recommendation for getting vaccinated. It's, it's one of the things that um, that is most important in getting parents to vaccinate their children is a provider's strong recommendation. Um, we have not been permitted to um, message a strong recommendation to receive COVID-19 vaccines. And, uh, and, and then there's this odd ideology that seems to have um, come into play where getting a COVID-19 vaccine is thought of as somehow placating uh, the left. Um, you know, public health is not political. It, it should never be political. Vaccines should never be political. This is public health. This is doing what is best for the public good. And um, and unfortunately, politics is has really um, seeped into um, this entire response. And, and doctor, you have said, I am afraid for my state. What are you most afraid of for? With our state's poor vaccination rates, which is not because of access to vaccines, but because people are unwilling to get them. What we're going to see is increasing cases, especially as new and more infectious variants like the Delta variant um, evolve in this pandemic. And we're going to see more sickness and more death in a state that has already had an extraordinary number of cases and where some one out of every 540 Tennesseans has lost their lives to this pandemic. Every death going forward is preventable. And it's only through getting those vaccines that we're going to see that happen. And until um, we get that message out to people and start encouraging them to get vaccinated and explain the importance of that, we're going to continue to see people die needlessly. Hey, the Tennessean has also reported that the state health department is now halting all vaccine outreach to children, not just for COVID vaccines, but vaccines of any kind. We've reported on the decline in childhood vaccinations during the pandemic. As a public health expert, just explain what kind of impact that could have on your state to not have this kind of outreach on immunizations? Well, we're about 30,000 doses of measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine behind right now that, that were not administered to children entering kindergarten last year because of the pandemic. Um, and that's a lot of kids that we need to get vaccinated. Um, you know, we're not permitted to remind their parents that they need to get vaccinated. We also had a huge reduction, 67% reduction in the number of HPV vaccines that were provided to adolescents just in April of last year compared to 2019. Um, and so the, the toll of, um, of the inability of public health to do the work of public health because politics has um, gotten in the way and begun to obstruct this access uh, for Tennesseans um, can result in not only outbreaks of highly infectious diseases like measles, diseases like measles, but you know even impacts individuals maybe 20, 30, 40 years down the road um, with diseases that we could have prevented right now. Just talk about the broader atmosphere facing public health officials right now, especially in states like yours with higher rates of vaccine hesitancy. Now, there are 64 um, people in my position, my former position, across the states and territories um, and tribes in, in the country. And um, I'm the 25th that I'm aware of that has resigned or been fired or retired early um, from that post just over the course of the pandemic. And so, um, you know, for the, the other 24 individuals that were in my role and for those that remain, 
Um, I have been provided a platform to speak out in, in support of public health um, and tell the American people how um, politics is getting in the way of protecting and uh, and promoting the health and well-being of, of the people, not only in Tennessee, but in other areas of the state, and how morale amongst public health officials um, who always have what's best for the people that they serve uh, at their heart um, is just historically low at this point. And we're going to continue to lose really good career people um, as a result of this. And uh, and I just, I think that's tragic. Um, so I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you and share that message. And uh, I really hope that things can turn around um, before things are too late. Dr. Fiscus, we thank you for your time and insight. And we should note ABC News reached out to the Tennessee Department of Health about Dr. Fiscus's termination. And a spokesperson responded, quote, we cannot comment on HR or personnel matters. Thanks so much, doctor. Thank you. And now to the extreme weather across the country tonight, the fire emergency. Dozens of fires tearing through more than a million acres up and down the West Coast. And in Arizona, flash flooding from monsoon rains tearing down burn scarred hills and tornadoes tonight in Iowa. Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us in a moment. But first, Matt Gutman reports in from the fire lines of California. Tonight, 68 large fires are burning in 12 western states. More than a million acres scorched. That's nearly as big as the state of Delaware. Overnight in Washington state, the entire town of Nepsalem running for their lives. Horses and humans got out safely, but some homes were lost. Been here for 20 years, you know, and you kind of grow attached to it. Nice little humble home, but it was my home. In Oregon, one of the first mega fires of 2021, the bootleg fire now 220,000 acres. It is out of control, and authorities say it will burn until late fall. I wish we had something more than extreme to explain it because it's, it's historical fire behavior, historical drought that we're seeing out here. That drought driven by climate change. In fact, so many waterways are dry that the state of California had to relocate over a million baby salmon 122 miles to a hatchery with more water. Just brutally dry conditions. Matt Gutman joins us now. And Matt joins us live from Madera County, California, where the river fire is still burning. Matt, what are officials there telling you? They've got a pretty good handle on this fire, Lindsay, uh, at this point. It's really just a mop-up operation, but just over the past couple of hours, a new fire has exploded in size. A couple of hours north of here uh, near Paradise, California, that town that burned down uh, a couple years back. So they are already beginning to divert uh, some of the resources, like this truck behind me, uh, and some of the 1,500 firefighters from this fire to that fire, and that gives you a sense of how busy it has already been this fire season, Lindsay. And Matt, we spoke with Governor Newsom last night who expressed concern about it still being two months from peak fire season. What are you getting as far as the sense from people who are on the ground as far as the concern about what could still be coming? Well, a lot worse is coming. I mean, that much we know. Uh, we are still, you know, a couple months back from the peak, as, as the governor said. But uh, what we're seeing now is sort of peak fire behavior uh, earlier in the season. So fires are burning hotter, faster, earlier than pretty much in living memory. Now, a lot of these firefighters that we've been dealing with have been out here for decades, but they've never seen fire behave like this. And it's largely driven by this historic drought, which itself is driven by climate change. It is so incredible dry out here and so hot that all you see behind me acts like fuel turbocharging any fire and yes they are very concerned for the next couple of months and one more thing not only are these fire seasons going to start and have been starting earlier but they are also lasting longer because of this drought and so little rain dampening all the shrubs the grass uh, and and the brush and the trees that uh, you see behind me Lindsay. Yeah, a lot of dread then about what could be coming Mac Upman, our thanks to you. And now let's bring in our Rob Marciano, who is tracking the fire danger, the extreme heat, and, and even some tornadoes tonight. Hey, Rob. Yeah, it's been a rough day uh, across parts of Iowa, especially. We'll start with the tornadoes, Lindsay. We had at least 11 reported tornadoes, mostly in northern Iowa, with several on the ground uh, just in the last couple of hours. There you see the watches up until 9 o'clock local time, and the very active radar. Most of this is north of I-80. Chicago and Milwaukee and Green Bay getting clipped, but that is a more tranquil 
thunderstorms, more garden variety stuff. In the east and northeast, the heat and humidity today has spawned some scattered thunderstorms that have had some potency across parts of northern New York and New England with a heat advisory up for the metro area. South of D.C., we had 63 mile per hour wind in Fredericksburg. There you see the cluster of storms heading across Chesapeake Bay. This will all wane tomorrow. The heat is waning somewhat in the west, but the fire danger has not. Red flag warnings are up for much of the northwest, especially east of the Cascade Crest over towards Montana and look at that flash flood watch that's been expanding the the monsoon is in full bore right now with uh, flash flooding likely with maybe some debris flows tomorrow again across parts of the areas there in the four corner states. Lindsay there's lots of extreme weather in all corners of the country Rob our thanks to you. You bet. Now to our nation's capital, where today Senate Democrats announced their agreement on a $3.5 trillion non-traditional infrastructure plan that they could pass without any Republican support at all. ABC's congressional correspondent Rachel Scott joins us now from Capitol Hill. Rachel, what's in this plan, and are all Democrats expected to go along with it? Well, Lindsay, the president told reporters today that he believes that Democrats will, in fact, get this done, but he knows that he cannot afford to lose a single vote from his own party. So we saw him up here on Capitol Hill today to try and rally some support for that massive infrastructure plan, telling Democratic senators behind closed doors that they really need to stay united on this front. Now, much of this $3.5 trillion package is still being sorted out, but we are told that it will be sweeping. It will include everything from immigration reform to climate change to child care, much of that will be paid for by increasing taxes on the wealthy and on top corporations. But still, you have a handful of moderate Democratic senators who are concerned. I talked to a few of them today, including Senator Joe Manchin. He says he's concerned about inflation as well as the size and the scope of this package, Lindsay. And how are top Republican lawmakers responding? Well, they are they are furious at this, Lindsay. They think that this is excessive spending in their words. They're calling it a spending spree. But the reality here is that they really can't do very much about it. Democrats uh, have control of the Senate. It's a 50 50 split. Vice President Kamala Harris is a tie breaking vote. So as long as they stay on the same page, they will be able to push this through. And lastly, Rachel, where do things stand tonight on the part of the infrastructure plan that Republicans and Democrats were working on together? Right, and this is a separate infrastructure proposal, a bipartisan one. We know that Democrats and Republicans have been meeting behind closed doors for weeks now, trying to hash out the final details of that. The biggest holdup right now continues to be just how to pay for that $600 billion in new spending. Democrats do want to get that on the floor in the Senate by next week, but the reality is, Lindsay, they are just not there yet. Not quite yet, Rachel Scott. Our thanks to you. And when we come back, Britney Spears back in a courtroom fighting for her freedom. We have the very latest. The alleged plot by Iranian operatives to kidnap a Brooklyn-based journalist. She joins us live. But up next, the assassination plot and the mystery. Who ordered the hit on the Haitian president? And why are there so many American suspects? Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. I just have chills. I will never get that picture out of my head. A pregnant 42-year-old woman gunned down. She is the girlfriend of a former Chicago bear. An 85 Super Bowl bear. Sean Gale. This was an execution. This is Sean Gale. She's dead. <laughs> when you hit the gun, did you hide it real well? It's now, the Jailhouse Interview. 2020, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. ABC News, honored, winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. People love a good scandal. Erica Jane. The Real Housewives star accused with her husband of staging a fake divorce. Thomas Girardi accused of embezzlement. The biggest question is, did she know? The housewife and the hustler. Only on Hulu. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. 
right, we're gonna move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by no people no squeezing no into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Take a look at these drunk trespassers walking into this popular chain restaurant in Chinatown here in New York after hours trying to figure out how to get some food. The pair tried to cook dumplings before eventually taking off. The staff was then stunned to come in to find their kitchen a mess and had to clean up. The CEO says the suspects paid for the dumplings after the surveillance video was posted onto social media and one of them apologized. He says charges have not yet been filed, but they are not ruling it out. It's been a week since we all awoke to the shocking news the president of Haiti murdered in his sleep. In the days that followed, it's been a dizzying array of headlines, twists and turns, the biggest perhaps that Americans may have played a role, including a doctor. Our Marcus Moore has spent the last several days on the ground there and files this in-depth report on where things stand with the investigation into the assassination. Video of armed men outside the Haitian president Jovenel Moise's personal residence surfacing around the early morning hours of his assassination last Wednesday. What happened next has rocked one of the world's poorest nations to its core. The gunmen presented themselves as DEA agents, but they were not. Inside the residence, a barrage of gunfire. President Moise shot 12 times, his wife injured, airlifted to a Miami hospital. She recounted the incident in a recent audio message. Quote, I am alive, thank God, but I have lost my husband, Jovenel. Mercenaries entered our house and riddled my husband with bullets. In the hours after the shooting, shell casings and bullet holes permeated the residence, the country in a state of siege. Haitian forces deployed, confronting and arresting some of those accused of taking part in the assault. And this is where the gun battle happened. You can see the massive bullet hole left in the wall here. And there are a lot of them on the building. Shattered glass and also spent shell casings. And look at what is left of this building, this burned out building. More than a dozen Colombians and two Haitian Americans are under arrest in Haiti. But one week later, the hunt for at least five others suspected of being involved in the assassination continues. Who organized it and why remains a mystery. Hasta el moment. In a press conference Monday, Colombia's national police chief saying that a Miami-based security company bought 19 tickets from Bogota to the Dominican Republic for a group of retired Colombian soldiers who have now been arrested in Haiti. Authorities also pointing the finger at this man, Haitian Dr. Christian Sanon, who lives in Miami. Sanon has long been a critic of the Haitian government, recording this video in 2011. Where is the leadership of Haiti? Nowhere to be found. You know why? because they're corrupt. He is now behind bars in Port-au-Prince. We tried to see him at the jail. We're here to see Salon. But we were told to turn off our camera and that visitors weren't allowed. Christian Emmanuel Salon. Haiti's chief of police says Sanon wanted to take over the government, that he came to Haiti on a private plane in June, and that he had contracted with a security company to enlist the services of some of the 19 Colombian men now under arrest. The assassination has left Haiti in a power vacuum stoking fears the country could descend further into chaos. Is there a power struggle going on right now? Who is in charge here in Haiti? I don't know if there is a power struggle. I'm not paying attention to whether or not there is a power struggle. I was an acting prime minister. I was a prime minister at interim, I should say. So after the tragic death of President Jovenel Moïse, I had to take charge. And I did. Interim Prime Minister Claude Joseph was supposed to step down from his role. President Moise had appointed another man to the role, Ariel Henry, just a day before his assassination. 
The interim prime minister now appealing for calm, but the situation so destabilizing, Haiti has asked the U.S. to send troops to help protect critical infrastructure and keep the peace. The White House says there are no such plans. Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It never fully recovered from the devastating earthquake more than 10 years ago. And even before that, this nation struggled under generations of chronic poverty, inequality, and political instability. Before the assassination, Jovenel Moise had been ruling by decree for more than a year and was facing calls to step down. But now, with a president deceased and a parliament that's been dissolved, more uncertainty awaits the people in Haiti. Francois Jean, a local shoe seller here, says he hasn't eaten in three days because the unrest has prevented him from selling anything. And the gangs in Haiti, now more powerful than ever. Violence in the country is escalating threatening to complicate stabilization efforts after Moise's assassination. Haiti's interim prime minister making it clear, though, that the priority right now is finding all of those responsible for the death of Haiti's president. Justice for President Jovenel Moise. That's what you all want. That's what the First Lady believes, that I can give justice to her husband, and I will not deceive Moise's family. Marcus Moore, ABC News, Port-au-Prince. Our thanks to Marcus for that. Still ahead here on Prime, the disturbing rampage, a gunman opening fire at a gas station, killing a man, how an undercover officer ended the ensuing shooting spree. The NFL star charged with domestic assault. Police say Richard Sherman also fought with the officers. We have the very latest. And some big news for many parents with the child tax credits about to start. We take a look by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Candace Parker, the first WNBA star to grace the cover of the NBA 2K series. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. Oh so what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people no squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show. ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. 
Welcome back, everyone. Now to some very welcome news for tens of millions of American parents. The new child tax credit, part of the American Rescue Plan, rolls out tomorrow. We take a look at what it means by the numbers. 39 million American households with some 69 million children will receive payments beginning this week, according to the IRS. Couples making up to $150,000 a year and single parents making up to $112,500 a year are now eligible for a credit of $3,000 per child over the age of six and $3,600 per child under the age of six. Now, this is an increase from $2,000 per child, and the age limit for qualifying children has been raised from 16 to 17. Vice President Kamala Harris says that this new tax credit, combined with other measures in the relief package, will lift 5 million American children out of poverty this year, slicing the overall child poverty rate by 50 percent. Half of the payments will be made over the next six months rather than after tax filing next year. This means that eligible families will get $250 or $300 per child each month through December, which proponents hope will help them pay for regular monthly expenses. These new child tax credits are set to expire after this year, but President Biden has proposed extending them through 2025. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. The 22-year sentence of Joe Exotic for murder for hire charges has been vacated and will be reconsidered. We'll explain why. The big push in the Senate to decriminalize marijuana nationwide. What happened today in the Senate? And could Matthew McConaughey really be considering a run for the governor of Texas? What we know, but first to look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. World News Now. And America This Morning. The best new video. The breaking news overnight. Emergency crews called to the town of Surfside. U.S. airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria. The stories people are talking about. You don't want to shave your legs? Don't. I was gonna say, oh my. Got it. And what to expect in the day ahead. ABC World News Now and America This Morning. Starting at 2 a.m. Eastern. Up all night to keep you up to date. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. This is what being live is Three all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing into this, this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. from three weeks ago when the collapse of the condo building occurred in Surfside, Florida. Yes, I'm a Champlain Tower. Something's going on here. You gotta get us out of here. Okay, you're in your apartment right now? 
Yes, but half the building's gone. The 911 calls capturing harrowing moments for residents who were racing to get out. Oh my God. What was going on? Now, three weeks since the collapse, 96 victims have been found. The youngest, one year old Aishani Gia Patel, identified just yesterday. At least 11 people are still missing. In Wisconsin, police have now identified the victim in that random gas station shooting as 22-year-old Anthony Greiger. Investigators say the gunman, a 32-year-old white male, viciously executed that unsuspecting 22-year-old Wednesday as he was pumping gas at this pilot station. The shooting happening at point-blank range. The shooter then opening fire at another person before speeding off to another gas station two miles away and opening fire again. But this this time, the target was an undercover investigator killing the gunman, a 21-year veteran of the sheriff's office who returned fire. There is no doubt in my mind the quick and heroic actions of our investigator saved lives today. A handful of Senate Democrats are calling to decriminalize marijuana at the federal level. Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey. This is the first time in American history the majority leader of the United States Senate is leading the call to end prohibition of marijuana. The senators admit they don't have the support needed in Congress to change the law, but cite the passage of legalization measures in states around the country. The Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act would help put an end to the unfair targeting and treatment of communities of color by removing cannabis from the federal list of controlled substances. Republican Mitch McConnell's already said he's against legalizing the drug. NFL star Richard Sherman is facing charges of domestic assault in Seattle. Police responded to a call saying Sherman was trying to force his way into a family member's house. So the domestic violence component for the incident that occurred in Redmond is as a result of the relationship between uh, Mr. Sherman uh, and his former in-laws. He allegedly fought with officers before being arrested. And then subsequently a canine was deployed to gain um, or to assist in gaining compliance. Sherman, who last played with the 40s, Niners is also being investigated for a hit and run accident which took place an hour earlier. Hey, hey. Conservatorship has got to go. Britney Spears heading back to court in California this afternoon in her ongoing battle to end her conservatorship. And a judge has just issued a ruling in Britney Spears' battle to control her own finances. The judge today allowing her to hire her own lawyer now as she fights to end her 13-year conservatorship. She also told the judge she wants her father charged with conservatorship abuse. Nice if some of my colleagues in Congress would actually step forward and join our bipartisan effort to create a federal cause of action for people who are constrained in their liberty through guardianship and conservatorship. It's not every day that a zookeeper went to prison for murder for hire. Well, the subject of the Netflix show Tiger King just won a round of court. A federal appeals judge says the man called Joe Exotic received too long of a sentence in this murder for hire case. A three judge panel ordering Joseph Maldonado Passage be resentenced. He was originally sentenced to 22 years in his murder for hire conviction in an alleged plot to kill Carol Baskin. The appeals panel found the trial judge did not correctly calculate the crimes before him when sentencing Joe Exotic. The reality TV star will be resentenced in Oklahoma at a later date. Welcome back, everyone. We turn now to a Justice Department watchdog scathing report on the FBI's handling of the Larry Nassar sex abuse investigation. The former USA Gymnastics team physician is now serving life in prison, accused of assaulting dozens of female athletes. And this new report says that 70 or more young gymnasts were allegedly abused between the time that the FBI was first alerted and when they finally searched his home more than a year later. Here's our Chief Justice Correspondent, Pierre Thomas. In a devastating assessment, a new report by the Justice Department's Inspector General bluntly states FBI agents failed to respond to the allegations against Dr. Larry Nasser, who's been convicted of molesting some of the nation's most prominent female gymnasts. The report slams the FBI, saying it also failed to respond with the urgency the allegations required and failed to take other steps to mitigate the ongoing threat posed by Nasser. His victims say the former physician for USA Gymnastics was a monster, sentenced in 2018 to up to 175 years in prison for assaulting hundreds of athletes, including Olympic stars Ali Raisman and Michaela Moroni. 
The world's best, Simone Biles, has also identified herself as a survivor of abuse by Nasser and in 2019 blamed many in positions of responsibility for not protecting the athletes. You literally had one job and you couldn't protect us. Now that new report raising questions about whether as many as 70 young athletes were assaulted as the FBI fumbled their investigation into Nasser. According to the report, after first hearing of the allegations in 2015, for months, agents failed to flag authorities who could have taken action. The report also found as the controversy blew up, FBI officials did not take responsibility for their failures, but instead tried to cover it up, providing incomplete and inaccurate information when questioned about their response. Lindsay, tonight, FBI officials making no excuses, apparently understanding the gravity. They issued a statement calling the Bureau's handling of the case appalling. The statement also calling the actions of some FBI personnel, quote, inexcusable and a discredit to the organization. Lindsay. Pierre, thank you. On Tuesday, federal prosecutors announced that an Iranian-American journalist living in Brooklyn was the target of an international kidnapping plot orchestrated by Iran's intelligence network. The alleged plot included attempts to lure Massey Alinejad, an American citizen, to a third country to capture her and bring her to Iran in retaliation for her outspoken criticism of the Iranian regime. The four defendants named in the indictment are believed to remain at large in Iran. And joining us now is journalist author and activist Masay Alinejad. First of all, just thank you so much for being here. So glad that you are safe. Give us a sense of the timeline here, when you heard about this plot and how you knew that this time it was really serious. Um, it was eight months ago and uh, the FBI came to my house and they actually um, announced that, that I'm under surveillance and they were saying that the intelligence service hired uh, some private investigator in New York taking photos of your private life. They showed me the photos. There was photos of my husband, my stepchildren, my garden, like me watering my flowers. And it was like shocking because I left my beloved homeland to be safe here. And I was like, wow, so now the officials are that close to me. Mm -hmm. So the FBI actually um, moved me to different safe houses. And, and so you learned about the details last night about the speedboats, right, to take you to <laughs> yeah. Venezuela and then to Iran. Uh, but you've been under this FBI surveillance, as you said, for, for quite some time. Just kind of explain what the last few months of your life has been like. I, oh. I saw a post where you had the police right outside the, the front door. It, it was not easy because um, the goal of the government actually to ruin everything, to dis to actually take my focus away from my, my work, from my job, because I'm a journalist, mm -hmm. I'm an activist, and I'm giving voice to millions of Iranian voiceless people. So I was like, you know, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do, the FBI was asking me to go live on Safe House on Instagram because they were trying to find out whether the um, intelligence service is going to find out my new location, and they did. And I was like, couldn't believe it, but at the same time, I don't know why, but something just helped me to be more determined, to be more loud. So when I was in the safe house, I started actually to get in touch with the mothers of those people who got killed in Iran protests. And now every week I'm giving them a voice and talking about every single person. Last week there was a mother whose son was killed in Iran protests, just broke her silence. I got my power back and I said to myself, look, you knew this was the nature of the Islamic Republic. You know that every day people get beaten up in the street. At least you're safe here and you have to keep going. You have said that the Iranian government is scared of you. What are <laughs> they so scared of? First of all, I'm a woman and the Islamic Republic is scared of a woman. I mean, if you go to my beautiful country, you will be beaten up mm. because you're unveiled. So um, I went to Washington, D.C., and then um, they kicked me out. I was trying to make an official complaint about death threats, and they said, no, nope, first cover yourself. I said, you must be kidding me, because I launched a campaign against compulsory job, and that is why, actually, I'm receiving death threats. So they called uh, the Secret Service to arrest me. So for years and years, the regime in Iran says that our biggest enemy is who? The great Satan, United States of America. But they were trying to call the secret service of the great Satan to save themselves from an unveiled Iranian woman. So that's why I, I strongly believe that 
Of course, it is a scary that they were going to kidnap me, but that shows that they're scared of me and millions of other Iranian women, Iranian men, who got united this time, loudly sending videos to me saying no to Islamic Republic. That's why they sent someone here in New York to kidnap me. They didn't want after President Biden. They didn't want after any, you know, no Americans. So that's why I, I strongly believe they, they're scared of their own people, and I'm giving voice to the people. And, and speaking of that voice, if their attempt was to silence you, it, it doesn't appear that that's working. That's not working, and this is not the first time. Look, um, first, actually, you know, on Iranian national television, that they said that I was raped. Can you believe that? They said that I was raped in front of my, my teenager son. It was a big lie. They, think if I'm a woman and I, if they say Massey was raped, so they're gonna discredit me. That didn't work. And then they actually made a new law saying that if anyone from Iran sending videos to Massey will be charged up to 10 years prison. I was like, my God, they're trying to make me feel guilty. That didn't stop women. I was bombarded by people inside Iran, by mothers who, you know, son was killed sending videos to me. I said to myself one day, they didn't give up. I'm not gonna give up. Then they went after my family. Right. They brought my sister on TV to disown me publicly. They, they inter was imprisoned. Yeah, they integrated my 70-year-old mother who wears hijab. She has nothing to do with my campaign, but they integrated her. But are you concerned that you're continuing to speak out? Because you weren't named in that indictment, you decided to go public. Are you concerned that that might have some kind of impact on your relatives and family members? That, that was not easy, easy. That was not an easy decision at all. Because you know, sometimes I cannot even breathe when I think about my brother and my family. And I love them. I'm a village girl. We always, you know, during the weekend, we get united. We go, you know, to our village all together. And now I miss hugging them. And my dream is to be in my own country. But what, I'm, what helps me to be strong and not give up? The people inside Iran. When I see that the women who are sending videos to me walking unveiled, which is a pu punishable crime, these are like Rosa Parks of Iran. Mm. So when they don't give up, then I'm not gonna give up because otherwise I'm gonna actually um, betraying my own people. And I wanna send the message to Biden's administrations, to the European Parliament, to the Western countries, to the leaders of the free world, that this is the regime that you're going to deal with. This is the nature of the Islamic Republic, to kidnap, to arrest, to execute uh, people. And I'm not the first one. Last year, they actually kidnapped another journalist called Ruhol Lazam. They, uh, they actually trick him from France to Iraq, and then they kidnap him from Iraq. They executed him in Iraq. There is a campaign called United for Navid. They are trying, actually, the athletes in Iran to give voice to one of the well-known athletes who got executed in Iran for the crime of protesting. And now the government send death, uh, death threats to every single athlete who live in Italy, live in Washington, D.C., live in California, live in Sweden. That's the nature of the Islamic Republic. And I uh, want to actually ask all the leaders of the free world to understand that do not abandon Iranian people. You have said that you are not just fighting for yourself. You just said a moment ago that you're not going to stop fighting. What would be the best possible outcome here? I want to meet with uh, President Biden. Look, I'm an American citizen. What is shocking here that they did that in New York? That actually shows you that my brutal government actually challenging the U.S. authorities. And actually, it says you that the time when my government were trying to kidnap me here in America, the U.S. government was trying to, to deal with this government. And today they call this uh, law, law enforcement. That breaks my heart. Because or when Behnam Mahjoubi was killed in Iranian pres prison, the U.S. administration called this bad behavior. It makes me cry, because this is not called law enforcement or bad behavior. I want to tell, actually, Biden administration, just by the President Biden, I want to tell him, imagine the government arrest your son, kidnap your son kidnap your own family, what would you do? So I expect you to do the same, stand up for human rights values, because the regime actually trying to manipulate the rest of the world 
And it breaks my heart when I see that people are, of Iran are being abandoned. Understandably so. Masay Alinejad, we thank you so much for your it's time. It's not easy for me because I don't I know what understand. I say here, what they're going to do to my family inside Iran, but I have to say that. Thank we, you so much for We appreciate your time and, and your passion. Thank you. Thank you. We turn now to Texas politics and some serious star power that could be added to the mix. Will actor Matthew McConaughey run for governor of the Lone Star State? Here's ABC's Zareen Shah. All eyes are on Texas as the state roils over a controversial voter restriction bill. But the state has also been buzzing over a potential 2022 gubernatorial run. All right, all right, all right. Mr. McConaughey or, or Governor McConaughey, whatever you want to call him. And I, and I say that for a reason. For Academy Award winning actor Matthew McConaughey. Matthew, why are you messing with us? Why? why? Are you running it's for... Stuff, no messing with. Really, what? honestly, there is no messing with. It's consideration. The Texas native, tight-lipped about running. Yes or hell yes? <laughs> Which one is it? I have no no plans to do that right now. As I said, that would be up to that a lot of That is such a political answer. This. Until recently, the 51-year-old on Ellen a couple months ago. It's something I'm, I'm trying to look in the eye and give honest consideration. What an awesome privilege, an awesome responsibility, Amen. an awesome position of sacrifice and service. Something to consider. Teasing the idea of Governor McConaughey. Should your next leadership role ever include you, you know, running for governor of this wonderful state, we'd be very happy. Right. But don't answer that. It's a true consideration. Like his desire to run, his record mostly a mystery. It's unclear if he'd run as a Democrat or Republican. According to KVUE, McConaughey only voted twice in Texas since 2012, in 2018 and 2020 general elections, according to the Secretary of State. And there's no indication he's ever made campaign donations at the state or national levels. But the megastar has been active in his community, joining UT Austin faculty two years ago as a film professor. Just to be pulled into his, his orbit, you know, his gravitational pull is so strong, and to just be around it is, is really eye-opening. And raising millions for victims during a deadly Texas ice storm. Tonight, we're going to show you the soul of Texas. Hosting a celebrity-filled fundraiser on his YouTube page through his Just Keep Living Foundation. Everything in Texas is big. We have big hearts. And recently posting pandemic PSAs. It's time for us to band together and see who can make the most badass bandito bandana so we can beat the Corona V. Bobby B style. But would McConaughey potentially risk his reputation on a possible run? Governor Greg Abbott saying on Fox News last week he's not dismissing McConaughey as a competitor. It doesn't matter what the name is, I take everybody very seriously. And Senator Ted Cruz calling him a formidable candidate on Hugh Hewitt's radio show. Star status hasn't always guaranteed a win, though. Just take California's congressional hopeful Antonia Sabato Jr., New York gubernatorial hopeful Cynthia Nixon, or Caitlyn Jenner, trailing far behind California gubernatorial candidates. I don't care if you're a Republican, Democrat. I'm running to be governor for all Californians. Celebrities turned politicians like Arnold Schwarzenegger, Ronald Reagan, and Donald Trump are rare exceptions. California has given me the greatest gift of all. You've given me your trust for voting for me. If McConaughey could be one, is still yet to be all. seen. When you take that field today, You've got to lay that heart on the line, man. Zoreen Shah, ABC News, Austin. Our thanks to Zoreen for that. And before we go tonight, our image of the day. They never stop searching. And 24 years later, this is the moment of father and mother finally reunited with their son. For more than two decades, the dad crossed China by bike, displaying photos of his kidnapped child. He became a folk hero in China, where an estimated 70,000 children are kidnapped annually. The match happened after police in China matched their DNA. We found you, we found you, his mother kept saying as they reunited tears of joy there that is our show for this hour be sure to stay tuned to abc news line for more context and analysis of the day's top stories thank you so much for streaming with us
up in the next hour of staying on top of several things. The Russian-based hacker group behind a series of ransomware attacks against America has suddenly gone dark. But why? And we're in front of the courtroom and have all the Battle of Britney conservatorship details. Stay with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Hey everybody, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Massive wildfires continue to burn out of control in the West. There are nearly 70 of them right now in a dozen states. In Washington state, some residents had to evacuate after one fire erupted. All this being fueled by a deep and persistent drought while severe weather threatens to the plains to the Northeast. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki would not engage when asked about that Russian-based hacker group that suddenly went dark. The group our evil was allegedly responsible for ransomware attacks affecting hundreds of small businesses and one of America's largest beef producers. No word on whether America, Russia or the group itself offline, but it did come just days after a conversation between Biden and Putin on tackling ransomware. A jarring update today from the CDC on our nation's drug crisis. Overdose deaths for 2020 rose by 30 percent, making it the deadliest year ever recorded. The director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse said that the pandemic created a, quote, devastating collision of health crises in America. The Institute also acknowledges that this all comes at a time when Americans were increasingly stressed and had difficulty seeking life-saving treatments. To the latest on the coronavirus pandemic, most of the country seeing a surge in cases once again with the Delta variant spreading rapidly coast to coast. Health officials say that those who are unvaccinated are most at risk, urging more Americans to get their shots. Here's ABC's Rena Roy. New warnings from the World Health Organization, officials telling ABC News we're at a critical moment in the coronavirus pandemic. Actually, the world is in a very, very serious and difficult place. And yet there is this extraordinary belief in the U.S. and in, in Europe that somehow it's over. But with the Delta variant racing coast to coast, experts say, unfortunately, that's not the case. What we've seen over time is a very rapid increase in the number of Delta variant cases. Researchers at the University of Alabama at Birmingham say testing of COVID-19 cases over the last few weeks revealed nearly three quarters were the Delta variant. The only way to stop it from progressing is to get vaccinated. In Arkansas, some hospitals overwhelmed most of the patients unvaccinated. All of our ICUs and our medical beds, surgical beds are completely full. So there's a little bit of disbelief that are we really going through this again? The daily case average across the country up 86% in the last three weeks. Cheryl Tucker, who's unvaccinated, still on the fence, even after just spending a week in the hospital battling her second bout of COVID. Will you get vaccinated now? I'm not going to say 100%, but I'm thinking about it. In New York City, almost all hospitalizations and deaths from January to mid-June involved patients who weren't fully vaccinated. Our thanks to Rena. President Biden sat down with Senate Democrats for a lunch on Capitol Hill this afternoon. The president was there making his case for the Democrats' $3.5 trillion proposal for so-called human infrastructure that would go alongside a separate $600 billion bipartisan deal to fund roads and bridges. A key group of Democrats announced just last night that they've reached agreement on the multi-trillion dollar package that will not require any Republican votes. ABC's Faith Abube is in Washington and has the latest. In a rare presidential visit to Capitol Hill, 
President Biden meeting with Senate Democrats to hash out any sticking points so his infrastructure priorities can move forward. We're going to get this done. We are getting this done. The president's visit coming less than 24 hours after an influential group of Senate Democrats announced a $3.5 trillion budget spending agreement to fund Biden's human infrastructure agenda. Priorities like expanding Medicare to cover dental, vision and hearing aids left out of a bipartisan plan. There's also money to address climate change and fund other safety net programs for families. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer saying the plan would give middle class and working people a much needed break. The very wealthy, the people at the top who escape paying all or a lot of taxes. No, 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 they're going to pay their fair share for the first time in a long time. Democrats say the plan is fully paid for. In a 50-50 Senate, they hope to use a process called reconciliation to bypass Republicans who are balking at the price tag. It is going to increase inflation. It is going to increase our debt or else increase taxes. The agreement is just the first step in what Democrats acknowledge is a long and bumpy road ahead. It's still unclear how many Senate Democrats are behind the agreement. But also in question, how they plan to retain GOP support for the bipartisan deal to upgrade and repair roads and bridges as Democrats try to use a dual track approach to pass both plans. I'm concerned about it, but they don't relate to one another. One is bipartisan, uh, responsible, no tax increases. And the other is, you know, a huge new spending spree. Our thanks to Faith for that. And now to the chilling 911 calls from that tragic condo collapse in South Florida. Residents pleading with dispatchers for help. Our Victor Akendo reports. For the first time tonight, we're hearing the anguish calls to 911 moments after the Surfside condo suddenly collapsed. Oh my God! Oh my God! Oh my God! It happened while most were sound asleep around 1:30 in the morning. I woke up because I was hearing some noise. I looked out outside and I saw the patio patio area started sinking down. The building just went to the sinkhole. So there will be many, many people there. This woman panicked, apparently calling from the part of the Champlain Tower South, still standing. British emergency? Yes, I'm at Champlain Tower. Something's going on here. you got to get us out of here. Okay, you're in your apartment right now? Yes, but half the building's gone. Another woman on the line with 911 as she desperately tried to escape from the garage. We think the roof collapsed in the building. A bunch of us are in the garage, but we cannot get out. We're going back up the stairwell. The garage is inundated with water. We don't know where the water is coming from. One man leading his family to safety while telling the operator. There's people in the rubble yelling. Rescue workers searching the rubble for 14 days, desperately looking for survivors. This boy saved the night of the collapse. The search recently shifting to a recovery mission. Crews, local leaders, and the community pausing for this moment of silence. Now three weeks since the collapse, 96 victims have been found. The youngest, one-year-old Aishani Gia Patel, identified just yesterday. At least 11 people are still missing. Still those unaccounted for. Victor Kendo joins us now. Victor, there are new questions tonight about warning signs that may have been missed. What's the latest on that? Lindsay, we have obtained documents indicating that as far back as 1996, inspectors were calling for repairs to the garage and to the pool. Keep in mind, that's just 15 years after the building was constructed. And while those repairs were eventually made, some experts that we've spoken with say that is still pretty unusual and will certainly be part of the investigation moving forward. Lindsay? Victor Akendo, our thanks to you. And now to explosive new testimony from Britney Spears in her battle to end her 13-year conservatorship. The pop star said that there have been times in her life where she's been, quote, extremely scared of her dad. She wants him removed and charged with conservatorship abuse. And the L.A. judge today allowing Britney to choose her own attorney as she fights for more control. ABC's Kaylee Hartung is outside of the courthouse and, and joins us now. So, Kaylee, Britney Spears said that she's been treated cruelly, not just abused. Give us more details about what she had to say. Yeah, Lindsay, for the second time in three weeks, Brittany stunning us all with her statement in court. She came out very forcefully and said, I'm here to get rid of my dad. She does not want him to be a part of her conservatorship or her life, for that matter. At times, she was emotional, in tears, but she was very strong in saying she wants him charged with conservatorship abuse. And now Jamie Spears is saying he's not stepping down. Brittany, with a new attorney, she has now been granted the right from the court to choose her own attorney 
attorney, Matthew Rosengard, a high-powered Hollywood attorney, now representing her. He says they will pursue this path to terminating Jamie Spears' relationship with Britney. But here's the key, Lindsay. Britney says she wants this conservatorship terminated altogether without medical evaluation. She made a big deal about that three weeks ago. She says she's been through enough of that. But if they do want to evaluate her, then she says she is comfortable with Jody Montgomery, her co-conservator of person at this time, staying on to manage the transition process into eventually ending this conservatorship. We know that there are a lot of layers to this. We know that this will all take time, but Brittany made it very clear her top priority here is getting her dad out of the position of control that he is in in her life. She described how, as a child, she was afraid of him. She was afraid of how he would come to her dance rehearsals drunk and embarrass her. This is a long time coming, a fraught relationship that is coming to a head here. And her strong and powerful testimony here certainly making a case to a court that she now has the attorney to back her to really pursue a future of freedom, Lindsay. And, and Kaylee, what else happened inside the courtroom today that, that really caught your attention? So, Lindsay, since that last hearing three weeks ago, it has been something of a blame game, pointing fingers, mudslinging, a series of petitions to the court because nobody issued any sort of rebuttal last time we were here at this courthouse. So today, a couple of those issues had to be addressed. Like I said, she now has this new court, uh, attorney, Matthew Rosengart, who she chose, but who the court approved. Uh, the petition from Bessemer Trust, the co-conservator of the estate along with Jamie Spears, the petition for Bessemer Trust to also resign. Uh, um, that petition was accepted. So now that leaves Jamie Spears as the only person managing Britney's estimated $60 million estate. Again, of course, something that Britney takes issue with. And I should have mentioned that along with that appointment of the new attorney, that was because Sam Ingham, the man who was appointed her attorney by the court 13 years ago, his resignation was also accepted. Something else that was addressed in a petition to the court this week, Lindsay, that, that didn't get addressed today, that's Jody Montgomery, again, the co-conservator of person, her requesting security and, and money from the estate to pay for that security because she's received death threats in the wake of all of this. The court saying they will address that in another hearing on Monday because they wanted Britney's new attorney to get into place uh, before matters like that can be addressed. It, there's a lot for Matthew Rosengart here to dive into, and he says they will go to the full extent to see how Britney has gotten in this position through more than, more than a decade of this conservatorship that, that she says has controlled her life to a, a point that, that has left her here. Just demanding change. Lindsay. Right, a, a lot to unpack and still much more to go with that. Kaylee Hartung, our thanks to you. And for more on Britney Spears' case, we bring in attorney Harry Nelson with the law firm of Nelson Hardiman. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Mr. Nelson. Great to be with you. So Britney Spears said that she's been treated cruelly, overworked, her vitamins and coffee were taken away, and she's at times lived in fear of her father. How serious do you find these allegations? I mean, I think the allegations here are very, I would say very serious. We're, we're hearing about meaningful and substantial financial abuse over a long period of time, an emotionally abusive relationship, and frankly, a relationship that seems to have basically ignored her human rights. I mean, this has elements of human trafficking uh, in the way that Brittany is, uh, is characterizing what her father's done over the last decade. And Brittany says that she wants her father charged with so-called conservatorship abuse. If what Brittany says is true, could that be considered abuse under the law? Absolutely. A, a, you know, a conservator like Jamie Spears owes a duty to act in the best interest of the conserved person of, of Brittany uh, and a duty to act, exercise prudent financial management for her benefit. And it sounds like he's failed on both counts. And I think she's going to have grounds, it sounds like, to pursue a claim against him for for his breaches of duty as a, fidu as a fiduciary. And the judge, of course, ruled that Brittany can now choose her own attorney. How much could that help her in this fight to try to end this conservatorship or at least get back some semblance of control over her life? I think this is a game changer. I mean, I think we, we've seen it's 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 a kind of a mystery to me how Samuel Ingram, the, the exiting attorney, has uh, served as her attorney and yet failed to put a petition to terminate this conservatorship or raise these allegations formally before this court uh, until this time. So I think we're going to see uh, the new counsel take an aggressive position. And I think we're going to be, as a result, the court is going to be hearing the issues and making rulings, in, I, I suspect, in Brittany's favor in, in the near future. And, and so I was just about to ask you to just kind of take out your crystal ball. So that's your bet that you think that Brittany will be able to get out of this 13-year legal arrangement? 
Yeah, I, look, I think the concern, the, I think uh, Brittany's attorney is now going to have to do the work of putting together a petition, of demonstrating that she's able to take care of herself, that she's able to manage her health, to manage her finances. And I think, you know, the fact that she doesn't want to undergo another uh, evaluation is going to give him some work to do. But I think I think that together, Brittany and her team will be able to demonstrate that she's somebody who can take care of herself and has the right to do so. So I, I think this is going to en end up being a story about Brittany actually being freed and, uh, and and is going to raise a lot of questions for years to come about how how it managed to last so long and so abusively. Harry Nelson, thank you so much for your time and insight. Thank you. Still to come, the global leader hospitalized because of chronic hiccups and the story that you just have to see, the notes of inspiration between children and hospitals. Stay with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Good Morning America, number one in the morning, nine years running. World News Tonight with David Muir, number one in the evening with America's most watched newscast. 2020, the number one news magazine on Friday nights. The View, the number one daytime talk show. And ABC News Live, number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. I just have chills. I will never get that picture out of my head. A pregnant 42-year-old woman gunned down. She is the girlfriend of a former Chicago bear. An 85 Super Bowl bear. Sean Gale. This was an execution. This is Sean Gale. She's dead. <laughs> when you hit the gun, did you hide it real well? It's now, the Jailhouse Interview. 2020, Friday at 9, 8 central on ABC. Now, as the country reopens with so much hope for a brighter summer, it's time to rise and shine. And we're celebrating by hitting the road. Let's, Let's do it. Traveling to all 50 states this summer. Let us shine. Let us shine. Yes, it's time to celebrate this summer with. It's ABC's Good Morning America's Great Rise and Shine Tour. Good Morning America. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded by people squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Let's go. Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. 
Welcome back, everyone. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Former President George W. Bush, who started the war in Afghanistan, is calling Biden's troop drawdown a mistake. His comments come as troops continue to exit the country. Today, the White House announced flights for Afghan interpreters and contractors will begin the last week of June. The announcement comes after weeks of mounting pressure to have the two groups safely removed from the country. The death toll continues to rise in South Africa. Hundreds of businesses have been destroyed and hospitals trying to cope with a third wave of COVID have been disrupted by the ongoing chaos in the wake of the arrest of former President Zuma. Soldiers have been deployed to the streets to help police officers deal with the outpouring of anger. President Bolsonaro of Brazil is in the hospital after suffering with hiccups for 10 days. A spokesperson for the president's office said that Bolsonaro was transferred to the city of Sao Paulo to evaluate whether or not he needs intestinal surgery for an obstruction that could be causing this. And speaking of intestinal surgery, which Pope Francis just underwent, he is now out of the hospital and back at the Vatican. The 84-year-old was released after spending several days recovering, but he'll need several more weeks recuperating time before he can travel again. Now to a new series from the History Channel, The Machines That Built America. It explores the innovations that transformed our nation, and Rebecca Jarvis gives us a sneak peek. From airplanes to tractors to television and radio, they're the machines, the risks, and the rivalries that built America. The history of aviation is really a life and death story. In the 1920s, Henry Ford is riding high. He's churning out Model T's left and right. In a new eight-part docu-series by the History Channel, viewers are brought inside the worlds of some of the most important inventors in history, including Alexander Graham Bell, William Harley, and Henry Ford. A lot of these machines were born out of rivalries. So the motorcycle, for example, comes out of a great rivalry between Harley Davidson and the Indian Company. No one knew what Harley Davidson was. Tractors, you know, an incredible story of rivals, uh, Henry Ford and the Caterpillar Company and others. Thinking about him just selling tractors to a government entity when he didn't even have anything, it's like just mind blown. The series highlighting competitive entrepreneurs just as the billionaire space race is underway, premiering July 18th, days before Jeff Bezos is set to launch. There's this rivalry to get to space and consumer space travel, you know, with Amazon and Virgin going at it. That's a great thing because competition really leads to innovation. Our thanks to Rebecca Jarvis for that. And now to that new alert. Officials in Minnesota begging residents to stop freeing their goldfish in local lakes or ponds because they could turn out the size of a football and create a lot of problems. ABC's Janae Norman has more. It sounds like something straight out of a movie. Goldfish the size of footballs, but it's real. Check out pictures of the typically tiny pets now causing some pretty big problems. Officials in Minnesota sounding the alarms. The city of Burnsville pleading on Twitter, don't release your pet goldfish into ponds and lakes because they grow bigger than you think. Pet goldfish released into the wild can grow over a foot long and live up to 25 Five years. Wildlife officials in one Minnesota county removed an estimated 50,000 goldfish from a single lake last year. Goldfish are like little vacuum cleaners. They dig in the bottom looking for food and uh, by doing so they disturb the, the, the bottom of the lake quite significantly. Professor Shemek Bajer's company was tasked with investigating Burnsville's goldfish invasion. It's not their fault that they're becoming invasive. It's, it's kind of our fault because we're releasing them. Our thanks to Janae Norman for that. What started as simple post-it notes on a window turned into something much bigger, a mysterious friendship for a five-year-old battling cancer, and it helped that little boy get through his treatments. Alan Chope from our friends at Kansas City Station KNBC brings us this story. Um, mystery friends. Mystery friends. Say, who do you think is over there? Five-year-old Myers fighting a brain tumor, spending more than six weeks total at Children's Mercy Hospital. His family started making post-it notes into art on his window. Then one day, they appeared on a window at a different hospital across the street. All your mystery friends changed the window again. On the Truman side. Just doing something fun. Staff noticed the work, so they started returning the favor. There are children over there, and I don't know what they're going through, and if I can make them smile just a little bit, that's all that matters. So with my 
fire on the eighth floor at Children's Mercy Hospital and the nurses on the eighth floor at Truman, it became a frequent post-it note art show. Every morning he would hop out of bed. As soon as somebody was switching, he knew. For weeks, the two sides exchanging pictures and messages. Other patients on the floor that enjoyed them as well. Artwork making one little boy smile through a situation where it can be hard to find one. Love to say that he is cancer free and I hope to, I can be able to say that soon. Myers family checking out of Children's Mercy and getting to meet the TMC staff that match them post it for post it. But Meyer leaving one final note. See you later. Thanks. That may have been his favorite. The see you later. Our thanks to Alan Shope for that. Just a heartwarming story. And that is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Have a great night.